Hebrews chapter 10. And for those that are, uh, for some reason or another, not coming here on Sunday when they should be, and, and they have decided to listen to the audios on YouTube, this is for you. <laughs> so, uh, Pastor Jordan has said for years, if the doors are open, where should you be? Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. This is an interesting passage because it shows us that uh, in the kingdom church they have the same problem. <laughs> and they're going to have it in the, uh, in the tribulation too. Can you imagine being in the tribulation period where everything in the entire program of God is culminating to, to the last seven weeks of, 70, uh, of Daniel's 70 weeks of prophecy. And it's, this is the big show. This is as big as it gets. It, it's, there's, there hasn't been anything this big since Calvary and the creation, okay? 70th week of Daniel, the last seven weeks of the tribulation, or the seven weeks of the tribulation, uh, and this particular book, Hebrews, is the book that transitions us from the dispensation of grace into that period. So it transitions from us to those who will be reading this particular book all the way through the book of the Revelation. Uh, I've told you before, they have nine Hebrew epistles back here, and we have nine epistles. We have four pastoral epistles, which gives us 13, but they have nine, we have nine, there's four that bridge the gap, and then there's a foundation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts underneath that. And, and that's how you lay out your, your New Testament. The, the, the book of Hebrews is a book to teach the Hebrews how to quit being Hebrews. Okay? And start listening to God and start doing what God wants them to do finally after all this period of their history, uh, this period of the dispensation of grace is over and, and we're into that period now, uh, when we turn into Hebrews, and notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for uh, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who came to do for us what we could never possibly do for ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that we have a Savior in him, and we thank you for the opportunity to preach Christ crucified. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more, notice what he says, as ye see the day approaching. Now, how are they going to see the day approaching? Well, they're going to be able to see some things because they have a different type of relationship with God than we do in the body of Christ. Uh, the nation of Israel, their whole program is based on prophecy, not the mystery. And so they have an entire Old Testament that has yet to be fulfilled. Now, much of the Old Testament and pre-Old Testament has been fulfilled, and much of it was fulfilled here when the Lord Jesus Christ came. But you know, when the Jews lived back here, they never saw two comings of Christ. They were never, they really didn't understand that. And although it is in the Bible, like uh, Jason was talking about Luke 4, you can go to verses in your Bible, in Isaiah and other places, that the first and second coming are both in the same verse. And it's fascinating when you see it, but we're looking back on it, so it's easier for us to see it, but they never saw that. They never saw the, the, this coming of Christ and, and this coming of Christ. They didn't understand that that was going to happen. And uh, they didn't realize that, and of course... Many of them died not realizing that. So it's one of those things that you, you start looking at this and you say, well, they have the same, basic, the, the same basic problems that we do, don't they, in the kingdom church. They have apostasy during this period where the churches are, many of them are apostate, and they've got one, one foot in denominationalism, and they've got the other foot in the local church, and they're trying to straddle it just like people do today. There's all kinds of issues that go on, and, and I think many of these things that, that we share with them are common, and it has to do with relationships, and we're going to talk about that. How many of you ever heard that, uh, that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion? Have you ever heard people say that? I've heard a lot of people say it. They say it on TV all the time. And uh, people say that, that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. And uh, as the Mormon was giving testimony to Jason about the... the Mormon religion, 
and of course he said it was, I think you said, he said it was a Christian religion, which is untrue, because there is no such thing as a Christian religion. It's a Christian cult, is what it is. And, and if you go into all the different various Christian cults, you'll see that there is a whole variety of Christian cults, and then there's a whole variety of cults that are non-Christian, that are used in other parts of the world. Hinduism, for instance, and, and uh, Shintoism, and Taoism, and uh, all of those isms that you see that, that Satan uses to, to mass other people in other parts of the world. But in this particular country, there is a, a need for Satan to use things that are more deceptive, and so he uses, what? Christian cults to do that. And he forms them here. Mormonism was formed here. And, and also you see uh, Christian science, uh, Mary Baker Glover Patterson, Fry? No, Mary Baker Eddie Gloverson Patterson Fry. <laughs> She's, Mr. O'Hare said she was a much married woman. You know, and uh, evidently there's four other names on there which signify she was married before. And uh, four times, exactly. And maybe more, I don't know. She started Christian science, which is neither Christian nor scientific. So you, you look at that and you say, that, that's a kind of a weird religion. But at the same time, they all have them. There's many, many of them. And some of them are Christianized. Uh, Catholicism, of course, you know, runs the whole world, most of it, in terms of that sort of thing. But, but it's over here. It came over here, too. And, uh, and we see this all over the place. And, it, and it's really, for us, it makes it sweeter when we learn about the fellowship of the mystery. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. You have uh, a, a very important passage in your Bible. Chapter 3, I've told you before, is the pinnacle, the apex of Paul's revelation. Uh, the first three chapters um, in Ephesians talk about our wealth in Christ, what we have. The second three talk about our walk and our warfare and what we're to do in our ministry and so forth. Once you get the, the information, then this is what you do with it. And uh, that's why in REC 1243, we talk about that Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and Colossians 3. And you're going to find out that most of what's going on in those three chapters are about relationships. And last week I talked about Colossians 3 and about you reading that and learning about that and understanding that. And, and this is really a relationship issue. Uh, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and start with me in verse... Well, just start in verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. He says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Now, Paul didn't write anything to the Ephesians that we know of that was Scripture, but I'm sure he wrote to them, but he also had written letters that they already had. And he talked about the mystery. The, the book of Romans teaches you about the mystery a little bit. And so other books that had been passed around, they would have known about this doctrine. And so he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. How? How was it revealed to them? It was revealed to them by the Spirit of God, and that was done from Paul's preaching. Look at verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been what? Hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. When something is hid in God, it's not hid in the scriptures. That's why it's called unsearchable. The fellowship of the mystery is your understanding of this, and in that you fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is your understanding of it that allows you to fellowship with other believers in it, and that's exactly what God intends for you to do. He wants you to fellowship with other people. That's why when Paul talks about fellow citizens and fellow heirs and fellow helpers and fellow laborers and fellow servants and fellow workers, we've been through studying these individually, and we're going to get to fellow soldiers probably next week and fellow prisoners and so forth, but... 
we look at some of these things and we don't always think that they refer to us. But I can tell you that my last two Monday nights going to the, the, uh, the prison at Avon Park, I, I, really, I, I really do appreciate the fellowship that those guys have there in this message. And many of the men that are there now are just hearing it for the first time. So uh, there are some there that uh, were in the class before. Many of them were transferred out. They send them out. They break them up, and they're, they're sending them to other prisons all the time. And uh, little do they know how much that helps ministry when they do that because the fellowship of the mystery gets, gets hold in another group. I was talking to uh, one of the young men there about the, my former ministry over at Sumter Prison, and he was there during that time. And I don't know whether I actually ever saw him there, but we knew some common people there that I've been in contact with and corresponded with and so forth. And these men write you letters, and they, they have questions, just like everybody else. But they, they have a tremendous need, and that need is to learn how to function as believers in that environment. And as Paul says, in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. How do you be content when you're locked up? Well, you have to learn some things. And Paul himself was locked up as a prisoner. And he wasn't the prisoner of the Gentiles in verse 1. He says he was the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So he's there serving the Lord, and they can serve the Lord too. However, we don't relate to that if we're not there so much. You relate to it a lot more when you visit with them and talk to them and see them, and you see what they go through there. Very, very tough environment. The, uh, the fun of all that is that they get edified, and so do we, and we realize that we're two fellows in the same ship going the same way, and, and really that really takes the sting out of it for them and for us because uh, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult thing for them to deal with it. We get to leave and go home. They don't. And so it's a, it's, it's a real problem for them because many of them are never going to get out, okay? And uh, some of them are in there for a long time. And uh, I, we have some older men in there that have been in there a while. But it's good. It's a good thing to, for them to be sitting down with their Bibles. And we've got the chart. We've got a chalkboard. And, and we've got King James Bibles. And uh, we're in a room about half the size of this one right now. It's a kind of a small place. But uh, we've, been, we've been doing pretty good over there, and it's a great thing. Um, I'm not going to be over there all the time from now on, but I am going to be there periodically. So uh, we're working with people right now to try to get that ministry uh, back where it should be. Ephesians chapter 3, he says that it is the unsearchable riches of Christ. In verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God. How do you demonstrate this? When you live in the dispensation of grace, what, what should be one of the foremost things on display in your life? I wrote up here that Paul's personal relationships are now on display in the scripture. And I, I'm, I just wrote down a few of these folks here. We'll, we'll try to touch on some of this. But the idea is that these leaders that work with Paul, they build relationships in the scripture, and, as did Paul. And you can see how Paul does it. Now, Paul is your example. He's to be an example in many areas for you, but he's definitely into the issue of personal relationships. And these relationships, when you ask yourself, why are these things put in there? Why are these greetings put in here and these goodbyes at the end of the epistle? Why, why is he talking about these men in details that seem to be more or less mundane business type ministry detail? Why does he do that? Because he's He's showing you how this is done, you see. Uh, take a look over at Romans 1 for a second. I always wondered about this. This is kind of an interesting thing. There's so many patterns and, and there's so many lessons to be learned from this man's life. And this is not by mistake. Romans chapter 1, this is by design. Romans chapter 1. And I want you to notice, Paul's talking about coming to see them. In verse 11, he says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, you may be established. That is, that I may be, what? Comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That's fellowship. But he says, Now I would not have you ignorant brethren 
that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. But what was the problem? If you read the parenthesis, he says, but I was let hitherto. And so when you see him being let hitherto, he's being hindered. If you, I've told you before the example of putting the bucket down the well. When I was in Bulgaria, we were out in Shrokidol in the village with this, these people's homes, really sweet couple. And uh, they were uh, up into their late 80s. And when I walked into their home, the, the ceilings over there are kind of low. You walk into their home and uh, they have this little kitchen, right? And there's two little beds in there that look like they're beds that you would have for your children. You know, you buy those little beds, you know? <laughs> These are really small beds, okay? And, and they're just little single beds with little mattresses on them. And they're back to the head to head, like on the wall, in the kitchen. And that's where they slept. And, and it dawned on me that maybe it's cold over here in the wintertime. Well, yeah, it is, right? But they like it in there because it's warm. And he's a farmer. He's retired now. He's old, not active. And she, she is uh, just one of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life. Both of them were really sweet. And it was interesting how they, they would kind of, you know, when you, when you talk to them, they had a, a bond between them that what you could tell had, had been going on for a long time. And th they really had, it was a sweet thing to watch their relationship. And we had brought some clothes from the folks over here in, it, uh, from Chicago. They had put together uh, a big suitcase full of clothing, the ladies did, just for her, for some new clothes for her to have. And they put a bunch of really nice clothes, and we hauled that suitcase all the way over there. And when she opened that thing, she just started bawling. She couldn't handle it. I mean, it was like, what is this? And she got all these new nice clothes. And so the both of them were so happy. And I tell you what, that, that next uh, six or eight hours that we were there with her and her husband, was, that was an amazing time for me. And all of a sudden, I just meet these people. Here they live, you know, thousands of miles away. I just get to meet them, and all of a sudden, there's an immediate bond. And that bond is not something that was manufactured. It was, it was just, it was there because we know what we were there doing. She, she knew why we were there, and, and we knew she was saved and her husband. And so there was this opportunity, and that opportunity to minister to them, and their opportunity to minister to us. And boy, it was very reciprocal, and I really enjoyed it. That lady could not speak a single word of English and I could not speak a single word of Bulgarian, and I, I had a tremendous time with her, and we communicated beautifully. And I learned a lot about that. Communication and, 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 and being able to form relationships can be done even with the barrier of a lack of a common language. It was amazing. And uh, it, was, it was very helpful to me to learn that because it, it, the, the other place that I'd been before, most people, most people spoke English, so it wasn't too bad, but this was very difficult. And so you begin to learn how important these relationships are. And these relationships that Paul has with these folks right here, just a sampling, they're on display for us to learn how important relationships are. Relationships in the body of Christ are required. This, this whole thing that Paul's talking about in Romans 1, He's not just saying that I want to come and see you. He was let hither too. And that hither too, it was a hindering. And we were, when we were there and we were outside at the well, uh, they had dug this new well and it was a cute little, they had a stone wall around the opening of the well and they had a roof over it and they had this little crank and you crank this, it was a brand new galvanized bucket and you just put the bucket down in there and you pull it up and there was a scooper there, and you could just drink right out of it, and it was, it was the coldest artesian well water. You couldn't imagine how good this water was. It's just as good as anything we have here, and it's coming right out of the ground. It's not processed in any way. It's deep. And as you let that, that bucket down, you're, you're letting it. You're hindering it from falling down. Okay? So in English, they say that they were let, okay? And so it's a hindering, it's a type of hindrance. 
And what Paul is saying is that, hey, I've been hindered from coming to you. We were let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Well, you know, it's not God hindering him because God's the one sending him there. But there you have an example in the very first page of Paul's first epistle that he puts, that, that is in the canon, that in his ministry of some almost 35 years or so, he begins his ministry and he begins to deal with the issues of being hindered and being messed with by people and by the satanic policy of evil. So what is it that you need in order to have successful ministry and have a successful life in Christ? You need relationships with people, personal relationships, and having these on display is fantastic. If you ever want to study this out, you'll find, uh, just go through, you can go through uh, and just look at all the proper names in Paul's epistles and you can just start picking them out. And, and you can see where every place in the Bible in Paul's epistles where they're used and just start reading them and take each person and I write them on the top of the page and I just write everything I can learn about that person on that page. And then I get to know, and then I see them interact and I'm realizing this is just like us. Right? It's just like us. And those relationships are critical. Uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you'll see how important these relationships are. They're very important. As a matter of fact, one of the, one of the biggest problems that we run into in ministry in general is lack of leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And, and, and what we're looking for is leaders because leaders build relationships. So we're looking for relationship builders. Well, what's the first thing you learn about this? Well, the first thing is that you need to have a relationship with your Savior first, right? You need to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that relationship gets straight and right and, and running like it should, then you're ready to start forming relationships with other people. Uh, we've had discussions about marrying and all these sort of things over the years and counseling and all that sort of thing and people talking about who should marry who and who shouldn't marry who and so forth. Paul's adamant. He sh you should not marry an unbeliever. Uh, he wants you to marry a believer. He wants you to marry uh, somebody who's in the Lord only. So when people go out and they deny that and they marry unbelievers, what happens? <laughs> Problems occur. Well, that's natural that problems would occur because they're not two fellows in the same ship going the same way, see? And so you have to work through those things. You have to talk about those things before you get married. It's just like handling your money. You're supposed to get the money and then spend it. Isn't that right? Not spend it and then have to worry about getting it, okay? <laughs> to pay it back. So it's the same way with people getting married. So you, they get the cart before the horse sometimes. And it happens. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's the way it is. That's not a reason to beat anybody up. But it is a reason to teach your kids right so that they don't do the wrong thing. And we're going to talk about the difference between good and bad and right and wrong because that's something that needs to be clarified with a lot of people today. Some people don't believe in any of that, that there is any such thing as right and wrong. Well, if you've ever been in a bad relationship and it wasn't right, you know how important it is to build personal relationships. Because, boy, they can go sour real quick. And as you find out, sometimes they go beyond sour, they become deadly, okay, and vicious. So what you want to do is you're looking for allies, you're looking for friends and helpers, you're looking for fellow laborers and fellow helpers and fellow heirs and so forth. And these people are all people that you can have good relationships with. I can tell you just from my own experience, and it's just my testimony, that, that you, can be, you can be disappointed by Christian people just as easily as you can lost people. Your expectations of lost people is not, not as high. Your expectations with Christian people are, tend to be a little higher, right? But it doesn't mean they're not going to let you down. They do. They fail. And in Christianity and in, in being in the body of Christ, we have to let that happen. There's nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen. You find out that, that first there is a need to have this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That begins with believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That begins with acknowledging that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. That's what people need to learn. That's the first thing, right? They need a Savior. 
They need to realize that God's payment for sin was his payment, not yours, and that that payment was adequate. And then you need to rely on that death, burial, and resurrection. And when you believe on him in that way, believe what we call the gospel of the grace of God, then you're on your way to developing and fostering a relationship with him. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. And that relationship will sometimes, just by association, bring some trouble into your life. Um, I've been keeping up through a particular ministry with the, the people who are being persecuted over in uh, the Middle East right now that are considered to be Christian people. And uh, I felt very sorry for some of them because they're losing their children, they're losing their parents. Uh, they had, uh, they were showing, this week they were showing the uh, ISIL army, ISIS army, they were showing them uh, dealing with their captors. Uh, were showing, they were showing from a film the captives. And these were not Christian men or anything, these were other Islamics that they had caught from the Syrian army. And they've got these guys out in the desert, and they've got them stripped down to their skivvies, and they're walking lines of them, you know, and they're just filming the whole thing. You probably saw some of that. And they're just walking through the desert. And you, you learn later, if you, you can't see the thing on the video because they cut it off, but they're walking them to a place to shoot them all. And they took them over there, and they shot every one of them. And, and is it, well, this starts to smell like Nazi Germany right now. Well, the reason for that is, is because these people they have a particular agenda and it's a religious agenda it's not a Christian agenda no doubt but even Christians in history in the dispensation of grace have done the exact same thing okay now I say Christians I mean I'm talking about those who are under that banner of Christianity and uh, the war in the Holy Lands during the Middle Ages was the same kind of thing they went down there and they did all that stuff and, and you wonder, when are they going to quit all this? And this is the big debate right now, is, is we don't want to go to war, we're war-weary and all that. Well, let me tell you something. There's not going to be any peace in the world until you get saved. And that's where you get real peace. And the grace of God brings that peace. But there's not going to be any international or national peace until the Prince of Peace comes back and he sets up a kingdom and he begins to rule and reign. There, it can't happen as long as people that are ruling and reigning are, and also those who are religious, you know, fanaticists, that they, they can't do anything other than you and I do in life, and that's sin. And so it translates into their leadership. And uh, right now, uh, this whole idea of leadership, turn to Philippians chapter 3, and what Paul's talking about here in Philippians 3 is the understanding of where he was before he got saved and then where he is at this point after that which is immediately after it, it the context it follows turn over to Philippians 3 7 and he's talking about if you look at verse 6 he's talking about his 4 5 and, and 6 he's talking about his pedigree verse 3 also but in verse 6 he says Philippians 3 6 he says concerning zeal how, how zealous was he? He says, persecuting the church. He's talking about, at that point, he's talking about the little flock, not the church, the body of Christ. He says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, he considered himself to be blameless. And by the way, there's no argument put in there in the text about that. He was blameless, according to the law. In terms of his understanding of what blameless is, there's two kinds of people that lived under the law, lost and saved. There are two kinds of blameless people under the law, lost and saved. So a guy can be blameless in the details of being under that religious system and be completely lost and not really a saved guy. There can be other people that are, that are uh, blameless under the law who are just, and, and that's the fruit of it. So you have these people working side by side, don't you? And uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell one from the other. It's like the wheat and the tares. You, you can't tell tares and wheat when they're young. You have to wait till it grows up to be able to decide how to pull them out of the ground. So now, you see in verse 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, because he profited in the Jews' religion. He says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss 
for Christ. So he took a hit, didn't he? He took a loss on this because he, 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 he chose the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. So now he's going to tell you that everything he's ever had and ever will have is not worth having. He says, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, that I may go out and win others to Christ, I am willing to give it all up. Well, isn't that what these people are doing over there right now in this religious system, willing to not only die themselves, but they don't care who they take with them? The suicide bombers? The queen of Al-Qaeda? She's in a, in a uh, jail in Texas, and she popped up. She was involved in the 9-11 scheme, and she pops up on the grid in Afghanistan three or four or five years ago, and uh, they grab her. And they put her in prison. And we fly over to get her. And when we get there, she hides behind a curtain. Well, I don't know why they got a curtain in the cell, but they, they, she hides behind a curtain. And she jumps out and she grabs one of the guy's guns and shoots him with it. He didn't die, but really? You, know, you guys go into a cell and get ambushed by a woman behind a curtain? It happens. Well, these guys subdued her, brought her back. They tried her for attempted murder just for that incident. And she's doing 86 years in a Texas jail. And all these people that they're trying to get loosed out of the prisons, you know, we're trying to get hostages back from them. You know who they want? They want her. You see, their leadership is very important to them. And their leadership is what they need. And, and here, Paul's saying, you know, all of this, I've given it all up. And that, that I may go out and win others to Christ. Well, they're just as zealous as you are. Actually, they're a lot more zealous than you are. And they got a dead religion. Where is Muhammad? He's dead. Guy said on the news, uh, or on the TV, he was a comedy guy. It was a commercial, and he said, uh, he was asking people this question. If Jesus was alive today... And uh, my kids will tell you, I talk to the TV, so I, I usually rebut, you know. And I said, you idiot, he is alive. <laughs> That's the way I think about it. I don't think about him as dead. If you do, you're in trouble. But, so we need to talk. But, but he says, you know, if Jesus were alive today, well, he is alive. Notice what he says, and be found in him. So what's the single most important thing for you when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to get the church, the body of Christ? To be found in him. What's the single most important thing for you if you automatically find yourself out of your body? Maybe it was a truck with a little dog on the front that hit you, or maybe it was something else. I don't know. Wh whatever it is. It, it might come today. It might come tomorrow. It pays to be ready. And to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You see, it took the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ to pay the payment that God would accept here. And he says, for that, I give it all up. I walk away from it all. And he says, that I may know him, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And why it's so important when he says that power of his resurrection is that if you don't understand the death, the burial, and the resurrection, you're not saved. And the power of the resurrection for you right now finds itself to be the means by which you walk in this world. Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. The, the idea of walking in him and walking in newness of life and learning how to stop all these things, what would be the biggest solution that we could possibly come up with right now to stop all these people from trying to kill us? What do you think it would be? Other than killing all them back. <laughs> you know, that's the only solution everybody's got now is let's nuke them, you know. Well, what do you do with all the people around them? And what if they do that to us? They just caught a laptop over there. 
and they looked on this laptop and this person that they caught that this they captured this thing the press lady got this thing and and they were there was all this data i mean a lot of data on weaponizing chemical weapons but weaponizing biological weapons and here they're dealing with all this ebola stuff and it's going crazy in africa and now these guys are talking about taking the, the bubonic plague which they know how to make that stuff i mean they got the strains and weaponizing that. How do you do that? Water supply? You put it in food supplies? You put it in air supplies? What do you do? How do you do that? These people over there with Ebola, they're just, get, they're just getting close to them. And they get it. They're getting it out of the ground. They're touching bodies. This 13 ladies all died. They, they prepared this body to, to bury and they all got it and died. And so these things are very contagious diseases. And if you take a, 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 a pathogen like that and you put it into to a system and you deliver it and you burst that stuff over the airwaves or I mean over the air of the of the city or whatever you might kill a few people you might not I don't know but they're trying to do it what are their intents you know what they want they want to kill so many people that they're the only ones left and that's not a that's not a strange way for people to think in this world that's not people that's the satanic policy of evil trying to get rid of the church, the body of Christ, and everybody else that's in his way. Because we are doing what? What are we doing for him? If he were to ask you, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> well, you could say this. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians. Did I say first? Second, sorry. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is talking to them about the son of perdition. In verse 4 he says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Make a mental note there. That's the greatest blasphemy ever ever that's going to ever be committed when satan himself literally sits in a temple during this first part of the tribulation here he sets himself up as god in the temple of god and right when that occurs the lord told him in matthew that when you see the abomination of desolation and you see that happen What's the abomination of desolation? Well, the abomination is what he's doing, and it's going to bring on the desolation because that's when the second half of the, of the tribulation begins, and that's where the shelling starts. That's where God's wrath is unleashed upon the world, and the fierceness, it says, of his wrath is let go. And so when you see that, well, he doesn't tell these folks to run for the hills. He just says in verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. You see, the issue with us is not to run to the hills and be fed by manna and protected by God. The issue is we're not going to be here when that happens. You see the arrow here going up on the chart. We're long gone before then. We're already up in the heavenly places. Satan has already been kicked out of the heavens into the earth here at the middle of the week, and they're looking for this right here to happen. And this is the precursor to that. That's the softening up. Believe me, God, God sends those angels out with the seven vials in the book of the Revelation, and they do something to the earth that had never been done. And, and believe me, when it's done, the earth as you know it, the beautiful globe that you see will not be the same. Read in the book of Revelation what he does and, and see what happens to the world. It's water supply, everything on it that's green, and it's just a real serious thing. It is forecasted and shown back here with Moses in Egypt with the plagues that he brings on Egypt. And what you're seeing there is this, this coming. Now notice what he says, verse 7, uh, verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now, what? How many of you use that word very much? Letteth. Letteth me do that for you. 
No, it's not letteth me do it. It's, it's a hindering. It's I'm going to restrain you. When we do uh, the tug of wars at the picnic, when we take the rope and let the kids pull it on that, you're trying to hinder what? Their progress because you go in the mud, okay? If you're, if you're holding that bucket down into the well, you're hindering it. We are here as a ministry to do what? Notice he says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and it's, it's begun in Paul's day, only he who now letteth will let continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his mouth, uh, excuse me, with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And notice verse 11, he says, for, And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all might be damned, he says, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What are you going to leave behind with the rapture? You're going to leave a lost world of 7 billion people behind. And when the rapture takes place, there won't be a single believer left on the planet. The 144,000 do not get sealed until over here. So there's going to be a period of time from, from the time this occurs till that occurs, and there it is right there, there's going to be some time there where things are going to be set up, so to speak, for this to occur. Now every time that tries to happen over here, what happens? It keeps recycling and going back to reset. We keep getting it reset. It never happens. And we keep looking at it, go, oh, the, the rapture's got to be close. Look at all this stuff that's going on. And then it stops and it gets reset again. But there will be a time in which that final cycle occurs right before this happens, and then it, it'll be done. It'll just, it'll just morph right in to where it, it left off over here, you see. And you never know. In your generation or your children's generation or, or your father's generation, you look at the whole thing from, you know, you can look back and you can look now and you can look forward a little bit. You don't know when it's going to happen. You have no idea. There is no prophetic thing for us to look at. Look over at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and notice that these people were being persecuted by some people in their day just like others have been persecuted in our day. A lot of people died in World War II, 50 million of them. And, and now, here we are 70 years later, and we're looking for what? Our recycling. Who's trying to do that? Well, we see it, and it's happening, but, but we don't know because we have no prophetic information for us to read like they do in the tribulation. They're going to read things in Hebrews to Revelation that will give them a day-by-day -day playbook effect to where they can confirm those things, you see. And they're going to have prophets. They're going to have 144,000 young men that heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and do all those things. They're going to have the two witnesses. They're going to have angels teaching from the heavenly places. You hear the everlasting gospel? That's preached from heaven during this period right here. And eventually they're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ come back on a white horse, and then, then it's all going to be over. It's going to be in response to what Satan has been doing to the world all along. What's going to be the end of him? It's going to be the end of that relationship between him and God. And the first thing he's going to do is he's going to throw him in a bottomless pit for a thousand years, and then he's going to let him out again, and when he does that, then he's completely destroyed. But the beginning of the end, if you'll notice his track, it goes down, 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 down. So he keeps going down. He gets kicked out of heaven, 
Then he goes down into the stellar heavens, which he runs. Then he gets kicked down into the earth, and then he gets kicked down into the pit, and then he's let out for a short period, and then he goes to the lake of fire. It's down, down, down. His, his doom is sealed already. He can read in the Bible his own demise. And I'm sure he has. I'm sure he doesn't believe it either. I doubt seriously if his pride will allow him to think that it's still not, there's still not a chance for him to win. He meets God at the Valley of Decision with an army of armies, and he thinks there's going to be a war there that he's going to win. Well, he realizes when this army is destroyed that he must flee, and he does. And he flees, and he races around the Holy Land area there, and he actually follows the same route that Jason was talking about this morning in Sunday school, the route of those in the wilderness, that trek of those people in the wilderness, the 40-year wandering. And that little track that they made, they just walked in a kind of a circuit, and that is the circuit by which he is chased and caught and put in. All these things are interconnected. All these things have to do with relationships and, and how they're going to end and how they're, how they're beginning and so forth. So your sanctification in your life, your life as a believer, you're told by God that you're sanctified by him and then you're to serve God with the saints. So there is this tremendous need for Paul when he's given this great job to reveal Christianity, what does he do? He enlists people to help him do that. There's a lot to look at. Look at Romans chapter 5. This relationship that you have with the Lord is really important. And it begins with a relationship that teaches you something about real love. I don't believe people can actually be in love until they're saved. I know that they can have human love, and I know they can have human affection because I see it all the time in people. I mean, people, even though they're lost, they love their kids, they love their families, they love their parents, they love their, their spouses and so forth, and they love their friends. But I'm, I'm telling you that, that, that what God teaches you about love is so, it is so detailed and, and so perfect that it is called the bond of perfectness, okay? So you can have you can have love, but, but when you understand the cross and you understand what he did for you, you don't grasp it. That's where you first grasp it. And this is what he says. Look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. And, and he says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this is a great love. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. When he loved you, he did not love you conditionally. We see love relationships that look like they're love relationships, but what we find out is they're really not. They're deceptive. Ephesians chapter 2. And God makes it clear. He's not deceiving you. He loves you just the way you are. Like Billy Joel. He loved Christy Brinkley just the way she was until he divorced her. Okay? So that's the way it is. I love you just the way. You are, okay. Well, okay. And, uh, uh, you know, that's fine. But, but all relationships don't end the same way, do they? Notice what he says in, in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 3, he says, Among whom also, in time past, in times past, the lust of our, in the lust of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for, notice what he says, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. That's Romans 5. He says, hath quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together, verse 6, and made us sit together, what? In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's a a demonstration of that love. Look over 2 Corinthians, if you will, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And you see what the Lord gave. You see how Paul... There's a, there's a real good study about the comparisons of the Lord Jesus Christ and Paul. Fantastic study where you see all the things that the Lord Jesus Christ did, you see Paul doing. 
And it's fascinating because he is, he is, out of all the apostles, the most personal protege that God ever had. Fantastic. I mean, really a very close relationship. More than it had ever been done before. And now you see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says, For ye know, verse 9, he says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. He gives you everything, doesn't he? He gives it all to you. And this sanctification that we live now, this separation from the world system, and this, this being set apart by God for this particular purpose that he has, you can rest on that. You are sanctified by God. It's a fact. The question is now, are you willing to form relationships with people that help you in your trek of being sanctified in your walk? Because that's really what this is all about. People help other people in the body of Christ. And these people ministered to Paul and he ministered to them and there was a reciprocal love relationship. I mean, Priscilla and Aquila laid down their own lives, he says, for him. They were business partners. They made tents together. They were in business. And they laid down their own necks for him, probably on more than one occasion. And you, you realize that, that this relationship, this was amazing. This is a very, very strong thing. Turn over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> I mean, these, these are long-term relationships that he had with them. All of them. Now, some of them, the relationships didn't go so well. They forsook him, uh, and they left him. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, and notice verse 11. Paul says uh, in verse 10, he says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. You be, remember when he had the, the blow up over Mark, that he went not with us to the work, and him and Barnabas split over that, and then he and Silas began to do the work of the ministry together. You see that now that Mark is profitable. What has happened in Mark's life? He's obviously changed the way he was, and he was young at the time. Sometimes those things happen. Verse 12, And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. And so as you begin to look at these guys and these relationships with these people, you see that he's got these folks involved in the ministry, and they're, they're really having a good time with him. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse 2, here's how close it gets with him. He says, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mine own son in the faith. Turn over to Titus chapter 1, you see the exact same thing. Three men he writes to in the pastoral epistles. Uh, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Look at Titus chapter 1. Verse 4, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Most of the time in Paul's epistles, he only says grace and peace. To the pastors, he writes grace, mercy, and peace. Why is that? Well, they need it. They need mercy <laughs> because they're involved in relationships that sometimes are very difficult relationships. It's very difficult to sit with somebody and talk to them about their indiscretions or their problems or their wickedness or, or whatever it is you're dealing with. Sometimes it's difficult to sit and talk to somebody where they've lost a child or a loved one and, 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 and they're just, they don't know how to deal with it. And you, you say, well, this could have all been avoided. But without these relationships, you don't have the mentors, the teachers, the students, the friends, the people to fellowship with that help you, people to rely on, people to, that, you, that rely on you, okay? The, these, these kind of reciprocal relationships, they, they build responsibility, don't they? They build into your life accountability. They build into your life the idea of being faithful, see? You remember you know, how they talk about people 
that are fighting in, in, in the military, how that when they go over to war, they're not really fighting for their country so much. That's kind of an idealistic kind of thing. They're really fighting for each other, aren't they? They're, they're, they're fighting with each other and for each other. So, you know, when, when, the guy, when the guy jumps on the grenade to save a bunch of guys' life, he's not trying to save Uncle Sam's life. He's trying to save his buddy's life. So that, that difference makes a difference in ministry. Uh, look, at, uh, look at Romans chapter 16. We're just about done here. Look at Romans chapter 16. And all through Paul's epistles, we have these great examples of these relationships. Romans 16, and look at verse uh, 3. He said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved uh, Phinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. That'd be the region uh, in Greece, okay? And he says, uh, greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who, notice, who also were in Christ before me. They're in the kingdom church. Notice what he says. Greet Amplius and my... Uh, my beloved in the Lord, salute Urbane and helper in Christ. Stachys, my beloved, salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Now, what do you think he did? If he's approved, what's he doing? Well, he must be studying. because That's how you get approved unto God, isn't it? So he must have been a student. He was approved in service, probably, in many other ways. But to say he's approved in Christ, that's a, that's a high honor. He says, salute them which are of uh, Aristobulus's house, he says, salute Herodian, my kinsman, greet them that be of the house, hold of Narcissus, and which are in the Lord, salute Trophina and Trophosa, who labor in the Lord, salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, and mine. So, there he gives a lot of personal salutations. Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and brethren which are with them, salute uh, Philogus and Julia, Neros and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So you see that this is like one big giant Christian family starting with Paul and working its way out. And it's growing. And the revelation of Christianity takes off and it grows 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 and, it grows and other things pop up too. I mean, less than, less than five, about 500 years after this is going on in real time, Mohammedism begins. The, the doctrines that we see that are Islamic, the, that the whole religion of Islam began just, just about 600 or so. And the Roman church began about 200 years after Paul when Titus, or when uh, uh, Constantine began to, he gets converted supposedly to Christianity and he, and he orders 40 copies of the Bible bound, printed and bound. And, and he begins, the official religion of Rome is now Christianity. So now we know what happened at Rome and where Rome is now. They went from being an imperial military empire to an imperial religious empire. And now we see it. And you see how it's working. There's a billion of them. There's a billion Muslims, too. There's a billion Hindus. There's a billion Shintos. And, and, and all these other samurai, these whole samurai group that's out there with the, with the uh, Buddhism and all that. Th these people are everywhere. So out of all the people on the planet where we live today, wouldn't you say that most of the world is religious? Yeah. Of some way, shape, or form. What do you need to get through all that. How do you deal with that? Well, turn to Colossians 3. Here's a good way to start, and we'll stop with this. Colossians chapter 3. Take this seriously. Take relationships seriously. Foster these relationships. Build them. Maintain them, because your ministry is built upon relationships. And this is just your support relationships, not so much 
you going out and reaching the lost. That's, that's gathering new relationships. But in order to do that on a daily basis and not get discouraged, you need support. You need helpers. And you need people to be involved with you. Colossians chapter 3. Relationships. Read Colossians chapter 3. And begin in verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So don't be numbered with them. Be separate from them. Verse 7. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now notice he's going to go down through here, and he's, going to, he's getting personal with you already in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. But then he's going to, in verse 11, he's going to start dealing with class distinctions and racial distinctions and how that in the church, the body of Christ, there isn't any of that. Look at verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Put those things into your daily life and your relationship toward others will, it'll blossom, it'll flourish. You're not so much worried about whether you're liked. You, you are going to find out that it's going to go way beyond that. It's going to be how well you're loved. And, you know, that's not really the goal. It's how much you demonstrate love to them. I don't need your permission to love you. And if you don't love me back, that's okay. I can still love you whether you don't love me. And if you do something wicked or mean or nasty or hateful towards me, I can choose to forgive you. I can choose to forbear you. I can choose to forget it. Look at what he says in verse 13. Forbearing one another. That's the first line of defense against getting offended. He says forbearing, forbearing, forbearing. And forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, he says. Notice what he says, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Not you, but the peace of God. And he says, to the which also ye are called in one body, be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Then he's going to go down through in verse 18, and he's going to deal with marriage, parenting, children, servants. You see how all this in just a few verses, 20 verses, he deals with all of these things. And it's fascinating to me, that when you get down to the bottom in verse 25, at verse 23 he says, And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 1.10, If I seek to be the servants of men, I am not the servant of God, and so forth. So, you, you, you remember who you serve in all this, and he says, verse 25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Now, when he's talking about, but he that doeth wrong, he's not talking about the lost people out here that you're ministering to in the dispensation of grace. He's not talking about people on the street. He's not talking about those who are out there that you know are lost people. He's talking about us. That's the context of this. He says, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong. Now, how is it that you receive for the wrong? How does that happen? Well... That's kind of scary for some people. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's why this is so important. 
and why I'm bringing it up because your relationships and how you foster and develop and, and build these relationships are with these people in your life are going to have eternal consequences. And those eternal consequences won't be your destination of where you go when you die. It's going to have a, 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 a real impact on what it is you do when you get there. And you can study these verses out for yourself. And if, if, if you want to talk about this, this is an important thing. I'm, I'm always willing to talk about this. Verse uh, 10, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says, that everyone may receive things, the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be what? Good or bad. Now, when you have right and wrong, as you see over there, you have wrong, and over here you've got good or bad, right? When something's wrong, is it bad? Most of the time, it's a bad thing. Now, what's he going to do with people in the church, the body of Christ, who are bad? <laughs> what's he going to do with people in the body of Christ that are wrong? You say, well, what does he do? Well, Colossians 3 says that he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. Now, how do you know that he's not talking about punishing you? This term back in 2 Corinthians, he says here that uh, if we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, uh, that's a good clue for you right now, okay, to, to understand that that's where we are judged by Jesus Christ for our service in Jesus Christ. Look at verse uh, 10 again. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive, notice, the things done in his body. Well, where else do you do ministry while you're here? It's in your body, right? That's where you do it. That's, that's, that's the temple that's walking around trying to reach these other people to form these relationships with. So, so you ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Is that sin? No, it's not sin. It might be caused by your sin, okay? But it's not the sin itself because that's already paid for. The natural results of your own bad decisions, which might be sin... Can, re, can, can put you in a scenario or a situation that hinders your progress. Bankruptcy, for instance, bad decision, but it's the decisions that get you there that are bad, but once you get there, that's, well, that's where they try to tell you you're in good shape. Well, you're in good shape after a while, I guess, but what if you live in a state where they don't have bankruptcy laws like we do here in Florida? <laughs> what if you lived in a time in the past where they didn't allow any of that and they put you in debtor's prison and made you pay it off in there? Wow. What happens then? You see, decisions have consequences. Sinful decisions have consequences. And many times in our life, they work themselves out in lack of ministry. Or ministry done wrong for the wrong reasons all this is sorted out at the judgment seat of Christ Paul says in verse 11 knowing therefore I'm in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men that's what we do when we go out and give them the gospel he says but we are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences you see the issue here is not about you being judged for sin it's you being judged for service. Whether the service is good or bad, that will be determined. Whether what you did in your service was wrong or it was right will be determined. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and we'll stop with this verse. We're a little bit over time. I'm sorry about that, but I wanted to finish this up today. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and Paul says this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ, which is in Christ Jesus, excuse me, with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's quoted from Romans chapter 6, verse 8. And he says here, he says, if we suffer, 
If we do what we're supposed to do and we participate in the fellowship of his sufferings and we preach Christ crucified and we understand what we're to do and we believe what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not just what you preach while you're in Christ, but it's how you live in Christ that brings persecution from the world. And you stand up and start talking to people that, that really don't like you because you say you're a Christian and now they don't even know you. And now all of a sudden it's just because you're an infidel, they're ready to kill you and your family. You better stand up. But the way you stand up with them is what? Not with a gun. You stand up there with a the message. You stand up there as a leader who understands relationships and said this person has a problem. They don't have a relationship with Christ. How are you going to reach them? With a bullet? Look, all they can do is send you to heaven. But somebody's going to send them to hell, more than likely. And so the issue now for you is, is understanding that when you're saved and in the body of Christ, and you're dead with him, you have a place in heaven. We shall also live with him, verse 11. If we suffer, verse 12, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So if you deny this right here, and you say it is, it, it is, not, it is not for me, he is not going to take away your place in the body of Christ, nor is he not going to, he's not going to take away your place in heaven. He's not going to do any of that. He's not going to deny you those things. What will he deny you? He will deny you the place of reigning. That's the context. That's in the verse. He also will deny us. What? The reigning. He says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful to the rest that do. He cannot deny himself. He cannot, in justice, not do this at the judgment seat of Christ. He's just in all of his righteousness. He's just and he's holy and he cannot do this entire thing that he's done with the body of Christ and then, and then not reward those that did right, that did it. The kingdom program is built on the exact same program, by the way. Didn't the 12 apostles get 12 thrones just for walking away from their jobs and following the Lord Jesus Christ for three years? They all suffered a death. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, all of them were killed. I mean, begin with James, Acts chapter 12, okay? So this whole thing is not about, this is not about retreat, retirement, vacation, all that. It's, it's about those things when you need it, but it's because you're war weary out there doing the work of the ministry, putting your life on the line and doing these things, and we don't, we don't have a situation in this country right now where we've had to do that. <laughs> Not for the Lord. I was reminded when I went into Avon Park that uh, they gave me a little thing to put on my belt. It had a button on it. And in the Sumter, I didn't get one of those. And I said, what is that for? What is this thing? They said, that's if you get in trouble, you hit that button. <laughs> I said, trouble? What are you talking about? Trouble? <laughs> we never had any trouble before. What's this trouble? Well... I can tell you that uh, when we walked to the chapel and when we walked back, we're walking in a crowd of men, okay? And uh, so you never know. <laughs> you never know what they're going to do, and you never know what you might be called upon to do. All I know is I don't know what they're thinking when I'm sitting there preaching to them, but I do know that the ones that are in our room are not in the room with the other guy. And what are they doing in there? Well, they're singing, okay? Okay and singing and singing and singing, okay? And that's about all they do, okay, for an hour and 30 minutes. And we've been in there with the chart and the board and we've been giving it to them, okay? And they're sucking it up. They have to have special permission to come to our class. And I, I can tell you, I appreciate that because uh, it's one of those things that, uh, it was just a very small crowd that comes in out of the, out of the whole group. But they are what they are. And I tell you what, it's, it's a real pleasure to be a part of that. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for relationships. We thank you for our relationship with you, most of all. 
And we thank you, Lord, for those who, uh, who understand this issue. We, we, we do appreciate that. And, and the, the relationships that we have in Christ with members of the body of Christ, they are sweet, Lord. And we appreciate the fellowship that we have, that we, that we have with one another and uh, the friendships that have been made over the years and, and the bonds that occur that, that when it comes right down to it, it it's us. And it's us together and uh, it's to the end. We thank you for it. Uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, see you next week. Have a good Labor Day.